Hi, everyone. Thank you, PG, for the music. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we want to start by welcoming you to our November Learning that we're calling the People's Movement Assembly, Raising the Voice of the People. And this is being hosted by the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network. These learnings are an opportunity to bring together voices from around Virginia and beyond that are working to not only respond to the constant crises that are impacting our communities, but also build new projects, systems, and infrastructures that realize the values of democracy, equity, sustainability, solidarity, and pluralism. In September, uh, we held a kickoff event called Feel to Real that brought us together to share how our immediate responses to racism, pandemics, and environmental degradation are spurring new current projects. Um, and we both learned about the importance of centering care in our communities, but also that we can't expect traditional institutions to be leaders in responding. And then in October, we dove deeper into building a new economy in Virginia and explored the realities on the ground and how they tested our understanding and are spurring us towards directions in which we can learn and build together. So tonight with the, this People's Assemblies Learning, we have invited two groups working around the state and in the South um, to help us get started in exploring the People's Movement Assembly or the PMA um, as a method for taking the next steps and advancing our movements. And the PMA has a long history in popular struggle. And we'll formally hear from Matthew on the history and Brandon from current practices. And so they'll each introduce themselves before handing it over to you all and to this group to have a conversation together. So we want to invite you to say hi in the chat. Let us know who you are, what brings you here. Um, and then each of our speakers is going to have 10 or so minutes to share about their experience using and studying, practicing the People's Movement Assemblies. Um, and then we'll outline key elements of a PMA and practice sharing and synthesizing what we're learning. Um, so thanks again again, everyone, for being here. And I'll turn it over to you, Matthew. Great to see everybody. Um, I am just going to do a quick land acknowledgement, not a quick land acknowledgement, like an, an honorable land acknowledgement, um, just to kind of center us and, and, and think about the land that we're sitting on at the moment. Um, and so this is uh, borrowed from our friends at the Nonprofit Democracy Network. So we acknowledge that we belong to the land and the land does not belong to us. We are each on land that has been tended by indigenous peoples who are in deep relationship with the land for the benefit of both human and non-human beings. And these indigenous peoples are still here today, many still on their ancestral lands and many still embodying and preserving essential wisdom in the face of colonization and all of those lives reflect the beauty that, that lies beyond colonization. And we bother those people living uh, and ancestral, and we acknowledge that each of us comes from uh, a line that at some point was rooted in place. So if you want to take a second, uh, we invite you all to kind of acknowledge that, introduce yourselves to um, uh, in the chat. You can look at the website native dash land.ca if you're uh, looking up your site or where you're coming in from um, to learn the names and the peoples and the indigenous names of the places that you were dwelled from. Um, and we use these uh, names to remind us each that the names given to the land by colonizers are a fiction and that many of us have arrived where we are through the forces of colonization um, and that our visions of the future need not be limited by the system's uh, attempts to appear as inevitable. Um, we commit ourselves to addressing the histories and forces that have stolen and renamed land and to work towards transformative relationships that can shift power, resources, and land back to indigenous peoples. So I thank you all for coming and I pass it on to PG. Thank you, Matthew. And I will continue in the vein of acknowledgements 
and uh, spread that acknowledgement to an international level and explain our greet theme for today. Today marks the anniversary of the 1973 uprising led by Greek students at the Athens Polytechnic. The Washington Post today reports that in Athens earlier today, a demonstration was led as it is each year by a group carrying a blood-stained Greek flag from the 1973 uprisings to the embassy of the United States to protest Washington's support of the dictatorship in Greece at that time. In 1973, for a little background, uh, the military dictatorship in uh, the military regime in power in Greece since 1967 sent police and troops to crush student-led protests centered in the Athens Polytechnic. Officers opened fire on unarmed demonstrators and bystanders, and an army tank smashed through the gates of the Polytechnic behind which many students had gathered. The deaths at the Polytechnic led inexorably to the restoration of democracy in Greece with elections held in November of 1970. Thus the musical theme for today, which has a special connection to me with that. As you listen to the speakers to come, pay attention to themes if you can. As you hear from the speakers, go ahead and post in the chat things that you think are important. Take notes for later synthesizing and with that, let me hand it over to the speakers. So our speakers today are going to be Brandon King, a community leader who has organized PMAs with Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi, and Matthew Slats, who will share what he is learning about historic rural Black assemblies in Southern Virginia. And with that, if we could start with you, Matthew, go ahead. Thanks, Peachy. And, and I'll say, I'm gonna be quick because I think I'm, I'm excited to hear from Brandon and hear what his experiences. I will say my knowledge is, is coming more from a, an ed educated red, red knowledge than it is coming from an experiential knowledge. So, um, um, but I think we also wanna think deeply about how assemblies aren't a foreign thing. They're, they've actually been going on in Virginia for a long time. So I wanna, to share a little bit of, of a resource, actually, uh, an archive that to think a little bit more about how these 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 are these ideas and these processes are are again are not like far away from us. They're actually very close. Most of my experience with and thinking about people power was kind of nascent in a lot of ways, and a lot of that was spurred by what took place in Charlottesville in 2017 and being engaged in community processes and community conversations but like really not seeing the power in them. And it wasn't until crisis where I think this became even more apparent that the systems that we have in place fail us pretty much continually. So I started to look at, look at a lot of different resources. There's the ladder of civic engagement, which I think for the most part, if you haven't seen this, it's like thinks about like what level of, of control and power do we do when we do civic our, uh, engagement or civic participation. And so, when you think about all the meetings we go to, most of them kind of reside at the bottom of this ladder. Um, and so even the top of this ladder, like citizen control, I, I added in on the side, like freedom and liberation, because I think that's that's a goal. And we think we talk about that, but we never really get there. I never, and, I, and I really think that assemblies are one mode of trying to move forward to that. So but then I, I got very interested in participatory budgeting as a model for doing decision making at the local level and I'm doing that work now. And so that's that to me I'm, I'm learning uh, still about how that can be a, a process through which right, like local power and local knowledge can be developed and and supported um, in one way or another. Um, but then I also turn to like processes that are going on around the world and one that I learned about first was actually the one that was going on in Barcelona with Barcelona and Komu and and developing grassroots power um, to think think through how do they make decisions and do investments and was actually learned started to learn about Cooperation Jackson. So those are my two frameworks. But again, coming back to the fact that these aren't distant. And so it's always amazing when you start to see and understand and think about like what, what's been going on locally. And then you learn about something and it kind of opens up a, a new, another world, another instance. The process that I'm, or the group that I'm kind of like starting to dig into, starting to learn about based on this archive that became 
available is called, originally they were called the Virginia Community Development Organization, um, but then became this organization called the National Association for the Southern Poor. It was an organization that was started in the 70s. It started in response to the war on poverty that the, the federal government was developing the Johnson administration at the time and the failures of that war on poverty in the South. The fact that, you know, millions of dollars were being kind of fed into uh, local agencies, but then that money was never reaching the people who actually needed it the most. And so this National Association of the Southern Poor started to kind of like look at an assembly as a model to kind of like invert that process. Really believing, I think, as in most of these processes, that the, the again, those voices are the vital voices for making decisions and that people need to be at the center of the decisions that, that impact their lives. This is some literature from the archive that, that they, um, and I think it's interesting that they're using this kind of, you know, is there a world where there is no government? And the reality is for a lot of us, our government isn't present in our lives in a lot of ways, and especially for black rural residents of the South. And so they make this argument that again, is it possible? Um, and so there's this gentleman, Donald Anderson, who actually worked for Adam Clayton Powell at the federal level, DC, left that and then started this process actually just outside of Petersburg, Virginia. That's where it began. Um, they started organizing, not in Petersburg, because of the amount of organizing that was going on in the city and really focusing on kind of rural areas and thinking through that and how do you, how do you build those relationships. They started to document for them, as you can read, right, the, this assembly is an organization which brings the people of an entire community into a systematic relationship with each other for the purpose of solving individual community problems. Here you can, I think you can see instances like of, of, of mutual aid and self-help, these phrases that I know have been a part of grassroots movements for a long time in the South. And so they started to organize um, on that level. And they use this model, which I think is interesting because they, ref they reference a lot of, sadly to say, uh, Jeffersonian kind of thinking. But I think if anybody, anyone knows of Murray Butchkin's writing on libertarian municipalism, like, like you, you see certain threads. I mean, the idea is that you've got, you can, people, one person probably has a network of about you know, 50 people that they're in contact with on a regular basis. And from that, those people can organize and address each other's problems and needs. But then when you start to scale that up, like if you, if you take 50 people and then you take another 50 people and then you have these representatives and then the, the representatives then meet together and then um, connect on a, on a much larger scale. And the idea, a lot of this is, is really getting about solving needs. So they would use these sheet, these these problem sheets, which I think are kind of interesting, where people would say, hey, I've got this, or I see this need in my community. They would like write this down. They would talk about the people that they see um, needing that need or where that need would take place. And then thinking about how they could respond to it. So that would be spread throughout the, the, the smaller groups, right? The, the groups of 50 to see if they could respond and bring the resources to bear to respond and, and engage that need. But if not, then they would kind of go up that ladder of connection between the other groups. And so, and the scale and the, and the resonance of getting more and more people kind of engaged in, in addressing those, those needs. So they started off, um, again, I said like primarily around Petersburg and then spread through the South. I think this map is a little bit, I don't, I don't actually know if they were working all across the South. I know they were. They had done some work in Mississippi, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia primarily. But you see how they're working in, in primarily rural Black Belt areas of the South. And this just kind of like another diagram of what was going on in Virginia. I love seeing the the relationships and the connections, um, and the, the the actual names of people who were kind of leading these processes um, in the various places. I will say again, it started in the '70s and pre-COVID. Just doing a kind of a simple Google search and seeing what I can find about this, I know that one of the organizing, one of the assemblies in. Appomattox County, Virginia was still organizing as of 2017. So there's a longevity to these. Some of them, you know, took place and kind of faded out over time, um, but some of them were start quite strong and they did, they, did, they did pretty amazing things. Just looking at like some of the, the results, I mean, like it's very programmatic, 
but it's also like they're also raising money they're raising money and getting funding to to like reconstruct schools or build a medical center your job training uh, provide housing all the core benefits um that that i think assemblies can provide and kind of organize towards achieving surrey county virginia is one of the ones where I have, I've seen the, mo the most information it wasn't only constructing a high school or a, a medical center, but it was also about a predominantly black, like rural uh, county actually taking power. Um, and so you start to see people step into roles either on the you know, school commissions or the county level or in you know various levels. So you start to see a kind of an inverting, finally, like an inverting of of the power dynamic between you know the black and the black majority and the white minority that are in these these communities, so it's a building of a of resources, it's a building of power, it's a building of people's political processes. That's all I really have in terms of this. We have an archive again that that was provided by some of the people who actually worked on this back in the seventies and eighties. It's something that. I know a few of us want to start to think about how do we connect with some of these people that were actually participating in this to hear more about how this was taking place um, and do some oral history work about about what might happen with it. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Brandon to lead us. Cool. Thank you, Matthew, for that historical context. I was born in Portsmouth, and so like, you know, seeing our name up there, like, it warms my heart because I, I didn't know that we had a history of assemblies like right up the street. So yeah, I'm gonna ground this in place. Like I said in my intro, I'm from the Atlantic Ocean by way of Hampton Roads, Virginia. Um, the current county that my family lives in is Suffolk County. And uh, that county is a place uh, where the Great Dismal Swamp is located. And um, if people are familiar with Dismal Swamp history, there's a history of Marinich. And so like, that's where I see, I guess, the history of resistance and also the history of, of direct democracy kind of happening. One of the reasons they called it dismal uh, was because it wasn't profitable land for like capitalist production. You can make a plantation on that land, but that land is so rich. It's so biodiverse. There's so many different ecosystems, like micro ecosystems that exist within that space and communities, Black folks, Indigenous folks, and even Irish uh, migrants lived and they didn't have a chief, they didn't have a boss, they made decisions collectively, um, horizontally in a way. I want to share uh, my screen just to be able to share. I, I've, I read this book um, called Intimate Direct Democracy by um, Adibo Kadali. And um, I just, I wanted to hear, I want y'all to hear him talk a bit about why he um, made this book. That's a big lie, really, just to break with it. And so we were trying to talk about the intimate direct democracy that was already here when the, when the conquistadors and the colonialists came. And they destroyed these intimate direct threads of democracy and created a, a sham democracy on top of it. And we tried to show it was happening in the Great Dismal Swamp, which was really a, a place of freedom and a place of refuge. And Fort Mose in, in Florida, which was uh, another place that the people were running away, running away to and trying to establish some kind of real uh, democratic uh, uh, a democratic tradition that has been lost and has not been studied. So that's why we wrote the book. So yeah, so when I think about people's assemblies, when I think about the work I did in Jackson, I think about it being rooted in resistance and being rooted in um, human relations, being able to make decisions in a way that um, we honor and affirm each other um, versus uh, logics around dominance. Uh, and so for me, uh, I, I come out of the uh, New African independence movement. Uh, so when you think about, uh, I guess, uh, a pop reference is, is Tupac Shakur. Um, his godfather just recently um, was released uh, from prison, um, Mutulu Shakur. He's a political prisoner, uh, also a doctor, acupuncturist, uh, helped a bunch of people 
um, in many different ways. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so you're thinking about me moving down to the South was uh, me thinking about where strategically can we fight for freedom and land on land that uh, there's somewhat of a legitimate claim to based upon population and also based upon the history of this country. Thinking about Harry Haywood and the Black Belt South, I'm thinking about the Republic of New Africa, thinking about what does independence, what does sovereignty look like? knowing that our sovereignty, Black sovereignty doesn't go above and beyond Indigenous claims, um, that we work in concert and that we work with each other, just like, you know, the Dismal Swamp is a, is a um, the Maroons are an excellent example of that. And, and so when I think about what's happening now, like in Jackson and just uh, in different parts of the country, even in Virginia, just with austerity and, you know, prices going up, and people having less and less control over our lives. I think uh, people's assemblies are a way um, for us to be able to come together um, to make decisions about the things that we care about. I think it's a recognition too that like the state in many ways has its objective, it has its bottom line, right? Um, and many times it, 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 it excludes the, the wants, needs, or desires of people. Many times it's, it's profit driven. And, and so for us, if we're trying to do something that is human centric, we're trying to do something that takes into account human and non-human relations. I think it makes a lot of sense for us to organize around the, with the people that we're around the people that we're with, the people that we see every day and, you know, make space for us to figure out what we care about. And that's what we attempted to do in Jackson. I think, you know, folks are still in the process of doing that, it's been many different iterations of it. It's been many different like uh, side formations, you know, and I think all of which I feel like is healthy because it's, this all is an experiment. Like us getting free is, um, it's not a, it's not a textbook that's going to teach you how to do that. You know, I think it's, it's, it's through um, praxis, you know, like putting the theory on paper, you know, putting the theory down in, in the streets. Um, and so, some things I do want to sort of lift up in terms of people's assemblies. And I think they could be good in terms of applying pressure to the state to actually do the things that people care about. But I, I don't I don't believe that people's assemblies should be coming from um, entities from the state itself, because I believe that people have an independent sort of needs, like the state a lot of times functions based upon like what donors give or what corporations sort of um, like, if they give you a bigger bag, then that's, those are the decisions that they're gonna make. And so to be independent from that, I think builds out a bit of power um, for folks and, and people are able to, to challenge the state in, in really, uh, really concrete ways. And for me, I see that uh, the, the building of these structures where people are making collective decisions can can eventually like dissolve and take over the use of a state that that is is illegitimate that isn't um you know meeting the needs of 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 people for me like that's dual power like that's that's the ultimate goal i want i want us if we could get the taxes that we we don't give our consent that goes to 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 the military that goes to the police if if those tax dollars were actually going into building housing for people if they were going into you know, creating a sustainable economies. Those are things that I feel like that we're on the verge of. In Jackson, we did have conversations with Barcelona and Camus uh, when, when they were coming to power. Um, they shared a lot of insight just in terms of their relation to the state. Um, and also when some of their folks got elect elected, like how things sort of changed and the contradictions in that and, and how, you know, they, they set up mechanisms to try to make sure that they're they're moving um, in more independent ways, you know, and I, I would say in Jackson, some of those ideas, you know, were mirrored in our situation. But yeah, uh, one, one other thing I want to share just before, I, you know, I take it over, turn it over to questions and stuff. Another kind of group that I think is really inspiring is also in the Americas, um, and, have, and they have a really deep and profound form of uh, governance, the Zapatistas. 
So I wanted to bring bring up uh, just the excerpt from a documentary um, that's up on YouTube. I'll share the links in the chat. But yeah, I think that that would be cool to share um, before ending it. Y el año de nuestro levantamiento armado es de que ya estamos libres entre todos y todas los y las zapatistas de construir nuestra propia autonomía y de autogobernarnos entre hombres y mujeres. Dijimos que ya no vamos a depender del mal sistema. Después de todo esto, presenta la necesidad de formar los tres niveles de gobierno. Estamos hablando de las tres instancias, de local, municipal y de la zona. El primer nivel, que es el local, o sea, formado por un, un grupo de compañeros, le decimos local, a un grupo de familias que están en un determinado área. Hay este, comunidades donde realmente pues, hay dos o tres compañeros bases de apoyo del ZLN y la mayoría pues, son, son partidarios que no comparten con nosotros. Base de apoyo somos los que de por sí estamos participando directamente, más que nada con nuestro ejército zapatista de liberación nacional. Entonces, pues dentro de, de lo que estamos dentro del zapatismo. Entonces nombra su autoridad y es lo que nosotros le llamamos gobierno local. La autoridad es solamente un gestor, un promotor que promueve la propuesta del pueblo o la necesidad del pueblo. Luego sigue el gobierno este, municipal, o sea, el siguiente nivel, que es este, los municipios autónomos rebeldes zapatistas. Cada municipio tiene su sede, donde se reúnen, donde se concentran y ahí llegan también los que quieren a ver sus asuntos, sus problemas. Y tenemos que consultar todo lo que tenemos que hacer. Aunque tengamos este, ideas, pero solamente proponemos al pueblo. Y si hay asuntos que sí se necesita consultar con el pueblo, entonces ya este, las autoridades locales llevan como propuesta. Pensamos de esta manera, pero no sé qué piensan las bases. Pues tenemos que llevar esta propuesta y en la próxima asamblea pues vamos a presentar ya toda la idea de todos los pueblos. Así se va solucionando, pero sí todos juntos. Y luego está ahora sí que el otro nivel de gobierno que tenemos autónomo es la Junta de Buen Gobierno, que es el, el nivel que tenemos hasta ahora, el, el más avanzado podemos decir. Y eso pues ahora sí ya lo forma un grupo de municipios autónomos. Hay, hay zonas que tienen cinco municipios, otros cuatro, otros siete, otros nueve, así dependiendo el área que abarque la zona. ¿Sí? Entonces hasta ahí es como estamos estructurados nosotros este, en gobierno local, gobierno municipal y gobierno de zona, que es la Junta de Buen Gobierno. Todos los gobiernos en las tres instancias es su deber trabajar y cumplir con los siete principios de mandar obedeciendo. Proponer, no imponer. Representar, no suplantar. Construir, no destruir. Obedecer, no mandar. Bajar, no subir. Convencer, no vencer. Y servir, no servirse. Yeah, just thinking about that and, um, and, and just, just the seriousness and, and being intentional about people may be far out, may be super rural. But how do their uh, their opinions um, be are get included in in decision making that affects their lives? Um, one concrete example I do want to share about Jackson, and it came from a group uh, called the Real People's Movement, Real People's Movement Assembly, and I feel like uh, the way they operated was in uh, in response to the way the ways that Cooperation Jackson was going about it, and also in response to the ways that the people who were working with um, the state, the People's Assembly from Jackson um, were, were working. And one thing that happened, someone had went to the city, it was an elder woman, who um, Ms. Pittman, whose a street is named after her. She was responsible for getting um, one of the streets called Mega Evers um, Boulevard. Uh, so she's a historical figure in Jackson, had a problem with their sewage. 
And she went to the city multiple times to try to get the city to do something about it. And y'all are familiar with the water issues. We used to get boiling notice almost, you know, monthly. And so going to the city with, that, with no avail and nothing happening, um, she took that issue to the Real People's Assembly. And what they did, they crowdsourced for resources to get and, um, and found local people who knew how to fix the plumbing, fix the sewage to get it done. And for me, it's like, it's that simple. It could be that simple. You know, what, what are some needs in your community? How can we pull our resources together and affect change in a positive, in a positive way? That's like at the very like concrete, small level that anybody could start. Like, I feel like that's, that's something that, um, a nugget that I wanted to leave with y'all. But yeah, I'm down to open it up to questions back to Matt, PG, um, whoever else. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brandon. Some of our experience here at VSM as we've summarized along the way through our learnings has been that, that there is this encounter with the state and we've kind of palpably experienced the, the, the difficulty in navigating that power. Coming out of elections in particular, we here in Harrisonburg, we, we've had a particularly disappointing experience that way. Something that really tested a lot of our frameworks, and I would put this to, to, to the room, is that in the past two years, we've seen unprecedented levels of federal funding. And it's kind of given us a window into how, uh, how money works, into what federal spending is really like. What we've seen in the, uh, in the COVID response is that, in fact, the national currency is a unit of account that we coordinate upon through the coercion of state violence, through the threat of state violence. And that says, you must do this to get that which expunges your debt. That which expunges your debt is the unit of account, the points on a scoreboard issued by the state. And once we see money in that way, we realize it's not scarce. It is spent into existence. And that's what we saw during the COVID response. And we saw this money spent into existence coming to our communities in the form of ARPA funds. And that tested some of our structures of solidarity, our ability to take that money that in principle is voted into existence by people and turn it to popular ends. I think in many places we had the experience that that's not how it flowed. This, what we see on the screen was a little intervention by Virginia Solidarity Economy Network, where we just leafleted uh, a, an additional input session that was yielded by the local government in Harrisonburg in response to dissatisfaction that was threatening the legitimacy of our government. So they opened an additional session and the organized voices behind that were soccer leagues, were real civic associations of popular, popular organizations. Here were minority, uh, non-Hispanic, white in the high school, high school level, a lot of recent immigrants, a lot of large Latinx community. And that's where um, some of this leadership was coming from. But it really, it really tested these, these questions and, and tested the logic of markets. And I see something maybe parallel in the experience of Jackson here with regards to demands that were made around the water system that the state and federal government immediately fund complete overhaul of the water treatment and delivery system. Now that we've seen what the federal government can do, a lot of ex excuses go away. Uh, the new system remained fully under democratic control. Here's the problem. How do we interface and maybe uh, raise a voice at, at that municipal level and let the new systems be built by the people for the people and that new systems be ecologically designed recognizing our embeddedness in the planet so with that little bit of of talk uh, do we have further reflections or uh, responses to the prompts I feel like, um, yeah, just bringing up Jackson and the water crisis, 
Um, one of the biggest issues, I think, is that number two bullet, you know, making sure that the system uh, remains fully democratic under the democratic control of the city of Jackson. Um, you know, we're we're in a time now where like, you know, neoliberalism and can sort of the selling of the state of, of things that the state should be responsible for to like private entities, private corporations. And it, uh, you know, it, this, you know, it's like the federal government has the resources to be able to like jumpstart, um, you know, and to fully fix the, the current system that, you know, Jackson, they're lead pipes and they're over a hundred, over a hundred years old. Um, and so no wonder, you know, this is, you know, the, you put some, a slab of concrete over top of a pothole without actually fi fixing the root of the problem, you're going to keep having these issues. Um, but that, that I feel like is the major challenge that, you know, the, the local government is facing. Um, wanting to have that uh, democratic control, but then, you know, not having the resources to do it in the state and the federal government, when the state is like Tea Party, <laughs> um, you know, Trump, uh, you know, supporters and, um, you know, the federal government, you know, you know, I think, you know, Jackson is a place that's forgotten about, you know, Mississippi is a place that's forgotten about. Um, and so, you know, I just, I think, I think about just the power of, um, of assemblies and just, just people coming together. And I feel like if the city of Jackson had a strong, uh, a strong buy-in from folks in the community or like the folks in the community are demanding of the state to um, to come in with resources, then I think it bodes a lot better than, you know, a politician kind of going solo to these conversations without the backing of community. Um, but, you know, I think all, that also requires a level of uh, a trust, um, you know, to be built between, you know, those who say they're representing us and uh, and the people. That seems to be the, the problem on our plate, how to build these structures. And, and we do have a, a resource as, as we come out of this, this event. As you say, not a, not a textbook, Brandon and, and Matthew, as you say, with a lot of uh, historical precedent, but here's just one example from an organization that's, that's worked with us some, the Southern Movement Assembly. And they, summed up some of their experience of working with assemblies as yet another perspective and looking at how to solve problems. So they think about what are the problems we face, what are the solutions, and where are we, what are we going to do about it? And for coming up with uh, techniques to do that, that's uh, that's some of the practicality because we find we find barriers we, we find hurdles. Some is just how to run a meeting. If we don't have that movement continuity, we've had elders who taught us how to do that, or we, we came up with this out of necessity. So they provide a little bit of this distilled experience, welcoming people, then um, starting with some kind of an agreement. We kind of modeled this a little bit here in our meeting and describing the problem. So we, in having our formal speakers, we've done a little bit of that. What is the political context? Then discussing the vision and solutions. That's uh, what hopefully we'll be doing in the next half hour or so with, with the prompts. Um, I don't know if we'll want to go into breakout rooms so people will feel more comfortable interacting there. But taking a very particular approach, like we saw in the Zapatista clip, not trying to get our ideas to dominate or win votes, but rather really listen and synthesize and bring forward, carry forward these voices to the report back and synthesize the, that voice and make something enduring out of it. A statement, as we saw in that Jackson statement, a plan of action and anchors to carry it forward. Hopefully we'll model this out of this meeting but let me, uh, let me throw back uh, to you with the prompts. How practically, and uh, it would be great if we can hear from more folks engaging Brandon, engaging Matthew, sharing your experience 
how practically do we do we get past these gatekeepers? Two things that Brandon said I think are really like for me are really potent, right? Like first of it's it's the simplicity, right? It's it's just being in relationship with community. It's not it doesn't have to be overthought. It doesn't have to be like it's just like just have to be like listening to people and hearing from them and and being there for them. And so I think that like what your community is can be a lot of different things. It doesn't have to actually necessarily be like people sitting around like who you live around. But um, but I think I think a lot about that in terms of I mean today I, I'm I'm working with a public housing advocacy group right now and. Um, on an oral history project, one of our team members is, has cancer. And then so it's like, how do we just be in relationship with her and support her and, and in ways that are deep and deep and, and they're very profound because it's just about being connected to people and being there for each other. And then thinking about how does that, that's like the core relationship. And then to build build from that. Because I, I, I also do think that, like I wonder a lot about like what, Having been involved in like community associations, which I think brands are like, great, right, those are all kind of state state mandated and then state controlled. And when you try to kind of exert power, then they kind of say, no, that's not the bylaws. Um, so kind of creating that dual power relationship is really, I think, more and more important. But I think people are so used to being like democracy is voting, democracy is letting someone else, electing someone else to go make off and make decisions. Um, and for people to kind of exercise that power and practice that power is such a key thing to kind of building people's consciousness around that and trying to see where that can that can lead i'm also working on a participatory budgeting project and i think like trying to balance like how do we build the power of, of community to to demand this luckily we have you know, city council members who are supportive of of it but like we've got to find that we got to build like we've got to build that demand from the community of of the, the possibility of this to actually make it I think worth really worthwhile. Okay, I'll unmute at will. Hi, I'm not ready for video after this long day. So, but I'm here. My name's Ariane. Thank you both so much, Brandon and Matthew and others too. If this is not an interesting question and you all don't want to answer it, I won't be offended. But I'm. I work for a foundation. And so I'm actually really curious if you have calls to funders or to philanthropy for how we can support people's movements. Cause a lot of progressive funders talk a lot about supporting movements and the ways that happen in my opinion are not always truly supportive. <laughs> so I have my own thoughts about it but I'm curious about your own experiences or your perspectives on it if that's something you feel like talking about and if not that's really okay too because that's a very niche question yeah sure I haven't yeah. had much much experience in Virginia um but my experience in Jackson um it really depends uh and I think it depends on the relationship that you build I guess with the pro project manager whoever holds your case from whatever foundation um and that they're clear about what your vision is and they'll allow the resources to go to like general operations or to like for you to be able to do what you got to do versus like having to hit every single deliverable on a plan that may not actually be the plan that actually works for the people at the end of the day because there's a lot of um, emergence that happens with movement building and I feel like a lot of times when you have uh, money sort of dedicated to a sp particular project, you end up spending a lot of time writing about stuff that, um, you know, like may not have happened the way that uh, the grant you got, you know, wanted it to happen, but you need to write it a certain way in order to keep getting money. And I, I feel like that's kind of productive. Um, I actually sort of wish that uh, it was uh, more so based upon you know, the work that you do and like maybe, you know, the folks who are given the money, uh, being able to do, uh, being able to shadow the organizers or being able to see like what actually goes down and for them to kind of make an assessment um, that way versus like taking people from their work to write a report about their work, which is taking them from their work. Um, yeah, I think that that could be a cycle that 
a lot of times folks who are good at getting the money, um, they do that, but then you see that uh, their programs on the street, like it's, it's kind of non-existent or like it's, it's very little, you know? And so like, it's a give and a pull with that, which, you know, it's the complex that we're, we're, we've inherited that we're, we're, we live under. I just want to add uh, that I think in well in Virginia especially there's there isn't a lot of funders that are going to fund <laughs> any kind of like networking relationship building because it requires space and right and, and all the organizers I know are like really busy just organizing you know, doing the work um, I mean I think we've we've had difficulty with it with VA Sen even like how do we like none of us are really actually in location together um, um, we're spread across the state and so what does it really mean to be in solidarity with each other across you know not only distances but like cultures and experiences and whatnot and I think um, you know keeping the door open for that I mean I, I know we need to find better ways of translating having translation even at these meetings to make sure that we're, we're connecting with our Latino communities. But I know there was a, a project in Chicago. I know a few people that were involved in it. It's like Just Chicago. It was a group of Black-led organizers and they got a grant from a foundation just to be in relationship to each other for three years. And so I think the more that things like that can be funded, those are the intangible like, what does it really mean to like build solidarity and the way you build solidarity is by working together on small scale projects it doesn't have to be huge like visionary things but like small things that like build the relationships that for me is one of the reasons i'm here is to kind of help spur that opportunity and see where that can lead by connecting all the amazing work that's going on because we know there's a ton of work going on the more more we turn around the more we're like that's amazing that solidarity economy or that's like great mutual aid work and like how do we be in relationship to each other? And I think that's, it's hard to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. This connects to a question that Betsy raised in the chat for me uh, with respect to what, what projects are we working on? For me, that really kind of comes up, comes into, into contact with the donors uh, in, in, in one big project that we had here in, in Harrisonburg, which actually followed the form of the PMA, if we if we look at the documents and history, that is, we renamed a street for Martin Luther King in 2013, and the formation that came out of that to celebrate the dedication each year held essentially a people's assembly, a PMA, a people's movement assembly, with spiritual component, music, food bringing all the community together against the forces of the major institutions, government and non-government, and including the influence of the donor class, the benevolent donor class, who really, really, I've learned increasingly have a strong need to be in charge, a strong need to be in control. And if you go off and do something on your own, there, there comes to be tension. And we went from having thousands of people in the street, literally out of a out of a 10,000 voter voting block of in a 50,000 person city with 20,000 students, having literally a couple of thousand people in the street saying, stop punishing our nephews who have served their time, to barely being able to get people out to vote this time during these midterm elections all of that organizing capacity through that working of those hereditary power and influence forces has really wound us down. It really worn us down. So we really are looking for, and we're doing People's Day again, Martin Luther King holiday, please stop by. It's always happened, but it's always a struggle. And I've not, well, it's been problematic sometimes interfacing with the donor class. Hey everyone. Um, so I'm not sure how to articulate my question, but this conversation, the things that it's bringing up for me are most of my organizing work has been via a um, nonprofit organization. And we have to, um, the funding question brought this up for me too. And we are, well, we're a coalition, we're a group of community-based organizations 
Um, and I see both the importance of structure and like the ways that structures can get in the way of the work that we're doing together. And so I just want to see if y'all can talk about like where are structures particularly important or what kinds of structures versus where, yeah, where there's more fluidity and room for our connections versus outcomes, for example, or outcome-driven um, strategy plans and work plans. Yeah, I, I I can take a stab at that. So like, I, I feel like there's a difference between sort of doing something, though it may be good, like, um, because it's like the directive or it's the campaign, you know, from your, the nonprofit that you work with versus it being something that is from you and your your close comrades, your the, the people you're close with and, and you, you're deciding to do it because it matters. And you would do it regardless of if funding, you got funding for it or not. But the funding would definitely help make it easier. But you know, the objective is clear um, regardless of pay strings or paychecks being attached to it. Um, for me, like, you know, moving down to Jackson, I didn't move down because of a nonprofit. I moved down because I felt like that place was was a ripe place that social transformation can happen. You know, I think in, in spaces where there's crisis, there's, there's opportunity. And I thought about what, you know, to, to be perfectly frank, what, what would an autonomous zone um, that's democratic uh, in 2023 um, look like, <laughs> you know, within the belly of the empire? And to be with people who have a lineage of, of doing that, um, years before I was born, you know, it felt it felt like it, it was the right decision. These structures and stuff, you know, I think all of these are like tools. They're utilities, right? And the people who wielded the utilities, that can determine what how the tools are used in, in time and space. And so I feel like if you have a mind set uh, geared towards sort of delinking from these harmful systems and sort of setting up systems that are more human centric that are like based in economic democracy solidarity economy and affirming people affirming folks on the margins then those are the kinds of structures that i think are worth spending time and making time to to develop and i would just say like just to be clear that your development of these things if the funding stops for the development those things still need to be developed you know, it's not like it's a end of the end of the day because you know a foundation felt like it was dangerous, so they they cut the plug on it. You know, um, I think I think it's like having a clear set of like what your objective is, and if the tools work for you, um, then continue to use those tools, and if they're not, then then switch it up and be creative. But at the end of the day, I, it's like about your connection to people and having people understand like what where you're trying to go, where where we're trying to go. Um, I'll unmute. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much um, for giving us all this opportunity to hear about the work in Jackson. The uh, Los Angeles People's Assembly has referred several times to um, your work, and it's so impressive to hear you talk. I would love to hear you say or just throw us a link to whatever principles you feel you might have for your organization, principles of engagement, community agreements for when you all get together. Is there anything that you, did you, you know, should you go through a process where you thought about demands? Did you use that word? These are words that are in the toolkit from Southern um, Movement. And I'd just love to hear you expand on that. That's where we are in our Los Angeles process. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, I could send a link um, with our community agreements uh, for like meetings. Um, I think that could be helpful. Um, but I think that like with our demands, it really depends on um, for the movement assemblies, they've changed. They've been in kind of response and reaction to things happening with the state. 
um, you know, when I first got to Jackson, it was uh, issues with the airport, um, the airport being owned by the city of Jackson and it being in the region uh, trying to commandeer and control it. The region is mostly white, uh, you know, descendants of, you know, plantation owners, uh, uh, you know, the slaver, the slaver class, you know, wanted to to gain the airport back after Baba Shokwe, who's who's the elder, was an elder in our movement, changed it from being in the red into the black. They say, oh, this is profitable, so now we want to take it. And so our people's movement assemblies were focusing on, you know, demanding it stay in, in control of the city of Jackson. Um, you know, another people's assembly that we had was in relation to participatory budgeting. We saw that uh, the city was proposing just a really small, like minute sort of portion of the, the city budget and claiming that that's like direct democracy when like the whole entire budget is the people's budget. You know, so we did a thing around like human rights budgeting and just while the city was doing this process also had this um, there to kind of to highlight the contradictions and to get people who are in that process with the city to push for more. Because they'll, they'll present a certain way and tell you that, you know, it's, it's democracy or this is the way it is. But, you know, we started this meeting like with the a land claim, you know, um, land, land, uh, land recognition. You know, and so like, what what are those systems sort of built on, and like, what is the truth? You know, and so it's kind of like going going to the truth, and like, I think for me too is just like, reason why a lot of people aren't engaged in like the the city participatory budgeting stuff or even the voting and all of this kind of stuff is because they don't see how it. They see that they participate if they participate and if they don't, at the end of the day, they they're gonna do what they want to do. You know, and that's that's the big feeling that people have. And I and I feel like for me to be able to 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 gather a lot of people who feel that way, to be able to to concretely change things that are happening in their lives, that builds confidence, you know, and that also lets you know that the state isn't something that is all encompassing. And that uh, you know, we can we can bring demands to them, you know, but at the end of the day, we need to figure out how we're taking care of ourselves and each other. You know, and if the state, we need to we need to claim the resources that they've taken from us, of course. And at the same time, we need to build out systems that can can affirm life and, and sustain us because they're taking us on the path of destruction with the climate, with like pollution and with all of the different things. And so we got to we got to we got to switch things up. But the principles, you can check out the um, the Jackson Kush plan. Um, I sent the link up earlier in the chat. And that sort of lays out um, the pillars of our um, our program, and sort of why we were um, why we were doing what we were doing, or why folks are doing what they're doing now, even in Jackson. Betsy, I'd be curious to hear what, like, how how you all are organizing too. Like, it's it's like this is not just a like you know we're here to listen and learn from you all as much as as we are from um, from each other. So. I, I'm always curious to hear what people's experiences are themselves of, of either being involved in an assembly or some form of assembly or whatnot, and, and what you found valuable in, in doing that work. Mm, thanks. I, I, I look forward to hearing from others around the country. We've got a nice group here. I'm going to defer to um, assembly member Donna Maeda. Donna, are you able to come on and answer Matthew's question? So I returned to Los Angeles after spending a few years in the Twin Cities area. I was there during all that happened after the murder of George Floyd. And that really prompted a lot of conversations about how communities need to come together to build um, what we need. And so it was a moment of lots of energy and lots of sort of thinking about participatory budgeting, as well as um, doing communities of care and all of that. And then just watching support for that kind of work go away has been incredibly difficult and trying to keep energy going up, going has been kind of hard for those who are kind of new to that at that time. But I've since moved to Los Angeles and I've been um, attending the LA People's Assembly meetings. And I think it's been helpful that there are a couple of sort of catalyzing moments. So one was the um, 
People Summit that took place at the same time as the quote unquote Summit of the Americas. And then all of the stuff that's going on in LA City Council, where it's very clear that the elected officials have nobody's uh, interests in mind except for their own power and maintaining their own power. And so that kind of prompted the older conversations to start up again. Where we are right now is trying to figure out how to move the energy from the anger of get Kevin DeLeon out of office, everybody, that's our demand, we have, and then we have to get somebody in place. How to move that energy toward back, I mean, how to combine that with, it's not just about the city council and getting in a city council person, but what are the mechanics and the processes and the, all the things you're talking about, moving it towards how do we build our own space and bring other, more and more people into the conversation about building what we need for ourselves. And so I think it's been really helpful to hear from you about um, starting with building relationships, because I think there's so much energy right now to, here's this one thing that we want to get done. And we're having a hard time kind of pulling back and saying we actually really get, need to get to know each other, because there's a small group that has been working together for a while that knows each other. And it's hard to be a new person in that conversation. So how are we continually building the relationships? So if you have any recommendations for that sort of not just relationship building with the people who already know that they want to do it, but to sort of expand on that, what has been successful um, strategies for you to be able to do that? Thank you. It I love it. Um, Donna, one of the things that I like, I always like in my back of my brain, the book Freedom Dreams by Robin Kelly is like on my nightstand. And and like there's these phrases in here about in that book about, and I see it on Charlottesville in Virginia a lot. There's like such a focus on being a, against something and not being actually for something. I mean, personally, like as like a, I would say a former artist, like and the value of creativity and imagination is such a big thing for me that I'm kind of always like, I'm always in the four camp. I mean, I know we need to challenge systems of power and whatnot, but like, I, I want to be dreaming and developing those opportunities. Um, and so like, I, I think a lot about, about that um, in these spaces. And I think we get caught, like I need just coming out of coming, coming out of 2017, in a traumatized community that just got traumatized again. Like we're always like, it's always about fighting against and against and, and thinking about like, how do we build solidarity around each other and actually work something, work, work for collectively work for something. Um, which I think has been a limit. Like I remember post, post yeah, again, post uh, all that stuff kind of going down and we had been doing some work before that. Um, and presenting, being like, oh, hey, have you seen the Jackson Cush plan? And hey, have you seen this work going on in Barcelona? And have you seen this work going on like in Hong Kong and like all these things? And people are just, were like, no, I wanna go take those damn statues down. Um, and I'm like, great, the statues are now gone and what has actually changed? So and maybe it's me too that I have to think back on my own, like maybe the statues were a starting point for thinking about and building something. So I, those are things that, I, keep coming up in my brain and and I think a lot about and and then how do we build the solidarity with each other in a real way versus not just a transactional like capitalistic way um and that takes time it's, it's, a, it's a slow process so well thanks again everyone um want to invite you to share any final reflections or appreciation out loud here or, or in the chat. I put an invitation to join the email list and we're, we'll also put the Virginia Solidarity Economy Network website um, so that you can see more about what we're up to. Um, we have uh, our next learning in this Feel to Real series is about the um, care economy. It's gonna have a similar model where we're in open conversation around around a topic. Um, so we hope that you all will join us. I think it's on, is it December 8th? Um, and we'll have our registration for that soon. Um, hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you again.